say the game is getting old. Monday morning and your coffee's cold. Life is not what you want it to be. You need another chance to be who you want to be. Yeah, you say that things don't ever change. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new direction. It's me, Jay Izzo, and guess what? We have another great show. I know, every week, Jay, would you stop telling us how great this show is going to be? Every show you say is great, but I'm telling you, it is a great show. I've got another great guest. I've got Ed Musio with me today, and oh, I'm telling you this book, this book, Iterate, I'm just telling you, is a great book. Do not let Iterate, the word, confuse you, fool you. If you do anything with management, if you manage people, if you're an owner of a business, if you are a consultant and coach like I am, I am telling you, you are going to want to pay attention to this book because as a coach and consultant, I'm stealing things from Ed. I'm just telling you that right now. I'm stealing things from him because he's going to help me even do my business better. And I know he hates that because he wants you to hire him but and do that because I really do want you to do that. But I'm telling you, I've learned so much from his book. It's going to be awesome, and we're going to have a great time with Ed and his book Iterate today. And he's, you know, he's sitting right around the table, you know, with us, right? And so it's going to be awesome. So everybody who's out there, you know, watching us live, people who are listening to us, maybe on a delayed podcast or whatever, welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you. I want to thank my, especially my California listeners. Oh my gosh, you guys are my number two listen to state. In the United States, here I am in North Carolina, and North Carolina is my number one listen to, the folks who listen to most of that state is there, but California, you're number two, and I want to thank you for being, you download the podcasts, you listen to the show, and I appreciate you, so I just want to say thank you for, for doing that, California, you guys have been awesome. So let's do what we do every week, though. Let's check in with you. Let's talk about the four areas of your life. How are you doing this week, right? Physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being miserable, 10 being I'm awesome and it can't get any better. Let's talk about the physical part of you. How are you doing physically? Are you taking care of your body? Are you eating right? Are you getting your checkups regularly? Are you exercising? What are you doing? How is that, How's the physical part of you? How are you feeling, right? I know cold and flu season is upon us. Did you get a flu shot, right? If not, what are you doing to protect to protect your body, right, so that you don't do that? And, and I don't mean like isolating yourself in some barometric chamber, okay? What I'm talking about is what are you doing to help your body grow? And, right, and look, look, folks, I don't care how old you are. You can always do more things with your body, right? I mean, one of the things when I was teaching – uh, lifespan psychology one of the things we you know I know is that as we age our oxygen levels get less which means that it becomes incumbent upon us to do more things to walk to exercise to increase our lung capacity because that's just healthy for us so scale of 1 to 10 where are you at and look we're not trying to get you from a 2 to a 10 today if you're a 4 I want to see what you can do to get to a 4.5 all right what do you need to do to improve yourself physically to get from a 4 to 4.5 or a 6 to a 6.5 that's all I'm looking for. All right, perfect, great. You got that in mind. Okay, now let's talk about yourself mentally. What are you doing? How are you mentally on that scale of one to ten? Right? I mean, what do you fill in your mind with? Right? I, I am so fortunate and blessed to do this show because what you know what I I get to read a book a week, right? And so I'm filling my mind. I'm I'm expanding my mind with reading and doing those things. What are you doing? Right? Are you learning a new instrument? How about a new language? Right? What, are you, what are you doing to expand your mind, to strengthen that muscle we call the brain, or I call the brain anyway? Right? And where are you at in the scale from 1 to 10? 1 being I'm not very good, 10, I really need to do, I'm great. And what kind of work you need to do some improvement? Awesome. Okay, let's move on emotionally. Emotionally on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being miserable, 10 being awesome, how are you doing emotionally? Are, are, are little things getting to you? Are you able to control your emotions? Right? Are you able to... Are, are you are you able to emote with others better right can you be intentional where you know you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off can you control that how well are you doing that piece of you right because you know emotions are intentional right we can be intentional we can we can talk ourselves out of our or into something emotionally we will believe what we want to believe and then the next thing you know emotionally we're blown up right but we could also do the reverse we could tell ourselves you know what this may not be the truth. This may not be real. This may just be my emotions playing tricks on me. It's okay. I can I can choose my attitude. I can choose my emotions. So how are you doing there in that world? And then finally, number four, how are you doing spiritually? 
right? And I know, right? I know, I know not everybody believes in God, and and I get that. But you know what? You you believe in something. Maybe you believe in karma, right? Maybe maybe you believe that nature is you know what gives you peace and satisfaction, you know. And maybe you do believe in God. And if you do, awesome. You know, how's that relationship going, right? Is it giving you peace? Is it giving you joy? Is it giving you a sense of satisfaction? Wherever you're at, how are you doing spiritually? Are you connected? And what are you connected with on the outside of yourself? And some people I know, like, they connect and they go, well, I don't really, I don't I, I don't believe in anything spiritual. But you do because you believe in yourself then to control everything. That makes you your own God. So how's that going? <laughs> All right? So great. So I'm glad you've got your scale. Look, every week I do this is check in and to say to you, how are we getting better each and every week, right? Whatever that is for you, how are you getting better each and every week? And what are you going to do in all those areas to see yourself improve? And that leads me to my next guest, by the way. I am telling you, I am so excited about Ed Musio. Ed Musio has been called one of the planet's clearest thinkers on management practice. Uh, by someone, by the way, who would know, the editor of International Business Magazine. He is CEO of Group Harmonics, that is Ed Musio, and author of award-winning books, including Iterate, by the way, which is a brand new book in 2018, uh, and Make Work Great, which is, was put out by McGraw-Hill in 2010. Among others, his books have won awards of excellence from the International Society for Performance Improvement, a professional association that requires both a clear and problem statement and a measurable result for organizational performance and improvement. And it's taken me so long to say this, but Ed Musio, welcome to A New Direction. Jay, thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate it. And I don't mind the imitation flattery situation either. It's all good. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Ed, by the way, Ed Musio is brought to you today by N-Line Brokers, business brokers and advisors, partners with business owners when it's time to sell their businesses. So when it's time to sell your business, contact the professionals at N-Line Business Brokers and Advisors. You can learn more online at nline.com. That's www. E-N-L-I-G-N dot com, and we certainly thank them for their sponsorship of Ed Musio and his book, Iterate, which you can buy on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your favorite bookstore. If they don't have it on the shelf, ask them why, and then order it and get it in, because that's what you need to be doing. Ed, the book is entitled, and I'm showing this to everybody, Iterate, Run a Fast, Flexible, Focused Management Team, and it's by Ann Inc. Publishers out of New York City, and uh, Iterate... All right. I, when I first when I when I when this book was first uh, shown to me, I was like, "Iterate." Okay, help me here. Help 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 my guests understand the word "iterate" and why that's so important to this book. Well, I like to use the the rather boring analogy of walking to your car across a big parking lot. So imagine you step out of the door of a mall or maybe an office building, and you are looking in the direction of your car, and you're saying to yourself, "I need to get there in three minutes." And so what do you do? You start walking. Now, you may or may not be heading toward the right car. You may or may not be going in exactly the right direction. But what happens is as soon as you start walking, you start gaining information. Now, there's that top level that's at work there, which is your, let's say, your executive office, your brain. That's who set the goal and the time requirement, right? Get to the car in three minutes. At the bottom level, you've got, let's call them the workers. They're your feet moving along the surface of the ground. And, and they're detecting if the surface is wet or slippery or dry or if there's gravel. And, and so what's happening is your feet are moving. They're not calling the CEO's office every time there's a piece of gravel. They're adjusting to it. If they need to adjust a little more than they can on their own volition because they need some more blood oxygen, they can make an escalation. That goes up to what we call middle management. That's your cardiovascular system. They can ask for more resources. And sometimes that system can satisfy that. Sometimes that system will actually escalate all the way to the CEO. That's when you get that feeling like I sometimes do, which is uh, maybe an indication that your physical health isn't where it needs to be, but that is, you know, breathe a little harder or walk a little slower, right? So, so you have this information flowing up from the bottom. At the same time, you have your eyes looking out over the horizon saying, that's not my car, or there's obstruction in my way, or something is not as I expected, and I need to turn. And if you notice that, that information flows down your quote-unquote organization and gets adopted into the movement of your feet. And so all that's happening, this whole system that's going on here, is really just doing the simple thing of what I call iterating, which is you take a step, and then you gain new information from that step, and then you incorporate that new information into the next step. So as soon as you see a need for something different, you adjust and change in small ways and in big ways. And that is what we know to be 
one of the most efficient ways, if not the most efficient way, to get you to your car when you actually don't know where it is. So it's the way we solve problems that we don't know the solution in advance. It's the same way computers simulate flight and weather patterns, things like that. It's incremental chunks, one step at a time, learn, and then essentially recalculate. I love that. I, you know, when I read that analogy that you put in the book about, what, you know, trying to find your car and you're walking to find your car, and I thought, oh, Ed, where are you going? <laughs> and then the more, <laughs> and then and then of course you know the psychology guy that I am, right? Then you start you know looking at it and go, okay, the, you know this this part of your system is middle management, and I was like, okay, I got it, I got it, Ed, I got you, I get where you're going, right? Because, right, we. We, 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 I like to th- I like to talk about habituation. As people know who know me, I have a my master's and doctoral work is in psychology, and I stunder, studied uh, behaviorism. My uh, advisor co-wrote the handbook of Be- applied behavior analysis, and I studied under B. F. Skinner's last student. So I have this huge thing about behavior, which your book, by the way, is awesome, and we're going to get into more of that piece. But you started out with this analogy of getting me to my car, and I thought, you know, isn't habituation a great thing because I don't have to really think about my feet, and I don't have to really think about I'm walking. And I think this is a large part what what you talk about in your book is you actually, there are certain things that we do in the business, in the business of management that we just don't think about, and it happens, which allows us to actually focus on the most important things. Isn't that kind of... Yeah, that's it exactly, Jay. You know, I hate to say it this way because someone's going to quote me, but management, at least management as I define it, is supposed to be boring, right? Walking to your car, <laughs> if it's very exciting, if you're dodging, you know, dangerous things or changing direction constantly, that's not good, right? right. Just like that, management is supposed to be kind of boring, kind of automatic, constantly adjusting the course of your organization, big or small, so that it stays on track to meet its goals. That way it frees up the higher level resources, let's call them the executive resources, sure. to be looking further out to, you know, two years into the future, let's say, or in the walk to the parking lot, maybe it's thinking about what you want for lunch, right? right. You need that system to run well, and you need it to run autonomously so that you can keep the focus where it needs to be, which is out ahead of you. That's that's the concept of the, of the kind of management we're talking about. Right, and, and I think what's really cool about what you are talking about in Iterate, about management, is it's really a feedback system. Right, and then you, so you give us you you give us the uh, analogy, if you will, of the thermostat, and that's re- that's really what all levels of management is supposed to be is is a fee- is really kind of a feedback system, right? You know, you get in trouble when you say that a little because people think feedback and they think of the meaning of feedback as in, you know, hey Jay, you work for me, so I'm going to give you feedback on how you're doing, right? And managers do that, but but you're saying it actually the right way, which is management. I say with a capital mint, right. management is collectively the set of people who operate as the feedback system, meaning they're the ones checking where we are, checking where we're trying to go, checking as to whether our new expectation of the future has changed, and making adjustments to our resources to keep us as close to on track as we can be. And, and that's different and distinct than what I call managing with a capital ing, which are the things you usually think about when you, and hear about and read about when you think about someone who's managing someone, like setting their pay level and giving them feedback on how they're doing and helping them grow their careers. Managing with a capital ing is super important. You have to do it well. It's worth getting good at it. But management with a capital mint is equally important. And I think it's not nearly as well understood, and that was a big part of why I wrote the book. Yeah, and, 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 and this is why I love this book, by the way. I'm showing the book again. Iterate. I went, look, iterate. Look, you see this, this blue cover? Yes, iterate is the book. Uh, run a fast, flexible, focused management team. We're with the author, a, a management practicing guru, expert, Ed Muzio. And, and by the way, I, let me tell you what's awesome about this book. And Ed, I'm sorry, I just have to say this. So I, I, I get this book, and this book is not just a book to read. There's activities in this book that Ed has put together that you can actually do with your management team, all right? I mean, there's activities. Not only is there activities, if you buy the book, ebook or the hardcover book, I don't care which one you buy, if you buy the book, there's a code inside that you can get that you can have access to Ed's amazing videos. I am talking, telling you that these are practical, useful videos 
that you can that you can do this stuff immediately on your team. I, I'm I'm serious when I say this. I, I read a lot of books. You know I do. That's what this show is about. Is reading. I read books. I try to translate them. I get the authors, and then I try to help you find a new direction in your life or your business or your career, right? But I am telling you, this is one of those books. Iterate is one of those books. It's got. He's got an appendix back there, folks. It's like he's saying. He's like saying, look, I'm giving you, he's giving away his consulting business in a book is what he's doing and saying, go ahead, run it. Go, go, go ahead. I'm giving you, I'm giving you all the pieces, all the tools right here in the book. I'm going to give you the videos. I'm going to let you run. Go for it. If you feel like you can't do that, hire Ed. <laughs> it's really, it's really simple. It's how he does it, but it's, it's an amazing book. So, uh, and by the way, make sure that you pick it up. Cause I'm just telling you it, it I don't care where you're at. Uh, again, management, CEO, mid-management, uh, even as an employee, I would highly recommend that you pick up this book because there's going to be something in there for you that's going to give you that aha moment because I, I probably have 150 of them in there. So maybe maybe 250, Ed, just depends. So Ed, one yeah, I'm going to take you on the road with me. I, 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 this is nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm available for weddings, bar mitzvahs, and all sorts of other things, Ed, so just let me know. Uh, so one of the things about this book that I found immensely satisfying, immensely intriguing, and that I fell in love with this book, in the psychology world that I come from, we talk about, you know, whenever we do a piece of research that we want to measure, we always say we have to create an operational definition Meaning that we have to create a definition that you can visually see and measure of anything. And when it comes to manage mint, capital mint, right, they are a set of behaviors. And you you are very clear and upfront in this book when you say, look, I am going to name, I am going to operationally define these things based on behavior. Okay, I am not... This is not a. This is not some because we we need to me- be able to measure what we're doing here, and so I'm going to use a specific set of terms. You you may be doing these exact things. You may call them something different, but just so that we have continuity, consistency, and that we can all be on the same page, right? I want you to understand these terms, and so we're going to operationally define it. And I thought, and you didn't use the words operationally define. That's just what I know it from graduate school and beyond. But I think the process of, of really focusing on what is it that your people do and operationally being able to define anything so it becomes measurable is critically important. Talk more about that. Well, you know, Jay, you and I were talking about this a little before we started here, but the, the, the vocabulary, the wording has turned out to be a giant challenge in this work because let's say I want to talk to you about a certain kind of data display and I call it forward-looking data, and I call it a pragmatic dashboard. That's just what I happen to call it. Well, as soon as I say the word dashboard, somebody pops up in a meeting room somewhere and says, oh, we have dashboards. And then it's that, it's that neurology thing where once you label the thing, the thinking stops. Right. So they kind of shut down and go, we already have that. We don't need to talk about it. Or we tried that, and it didn't work. Or I read a book about that. And so what I tried to do, and I hope I was successful in the book, was to just to be really clear and say, look, I don't care if you call it what I call it. I want you to assume that my label means something different than what you think it means right. for long enough that you could make sure you make sure we're talking about the same behavior. And probably you're doing some of the behaviors I'm talking about. Maybe you have that kind of data display. Maybe you don't. But, but if we stall out at the point of vocabulary, kind of like if we stall out before we ever define what we mean by managing versus management, then we can never get any further. And so, so I appreciate your comments. Like, I did try hard to stay behavioral and stay in a mode of, Call it what you want, but let's talk about whether you're doing this specific thing. If you are, here's why it's good. If you're not, here's why you might want to do a little more of it. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, I think it's so successful, and I, and I don't think you need to hope. You were very successful in what you were trying to accomplish here by doing, operationally defining it. And the the, Thank you. the more that I was reading it, the more that I was going, you know, this makes so much sense because, so often, especially in our United States, North America management world, right? We are so quick to pinpoint at and look at the person and say, this person did wrong, 
But the prob the problem with that is, and I think you, while you don't spell this out exactly, but what you what you really pointed to me was to say, hold it here. Is it the person, or did we not even establish or operationalize a set of behaviors and expectations so that they were already set up for behavior before they even started? Because we just were judging them on, we gave them a title, and so whatever that title is, we had an expectation, but we have no, we have no behavioral uh, measurable objective we're just rating them on something that we say, well, we're successful or not successful, and it's so nebulous. And that, and I started, and you, you know, you really point that out in this book, and I go, wow, okay, yeah, we need to change our, we need to wrap our mind around that and focus on thinking. Why is behavior? Why, why do, why should CEOs and upper level management? Why do we need to focus on behavior rather than, say, focusing on a title or the job. Well, I think, I mean, I think you said it very well, Jay, which is in the North, what I call the North American management model, which is kind of how we manage by default in this country. And we think that's about 80% of companies run that way. Uh, it's usually not the ones that are doing the best in their spaces, but it's the majority. And that's about how management works, right? The clearest thing we can figure out is to say to someone who works for us, you know, so I heard direct employee, and I say to them, you know, here are your goals. And, and maybe I can be measurable about your goals and get your goals real clear. And then I say, go off and deliver that, right? So, so that's kind of good because it's kind of specific. But, but the problem with that is, you know, let's say, Jay, you and I work for the same boss. So, so our boss, she gives me a set of goals and says, Ed, go get those goals. And she gives you a different set of goals for your area and says, Jay, go get those goals. That's fine until you and I need the same resource to accomplish a goal. And now what happens is we're going to go to her, either together or separately, and start lobbying for our results. All of this flows out of what I call kind of like the mythology of autonomy, which is common, you know, in our North American culture, we like autonomy. We like this model of, you know, the guy on the horse who rides off into the sunset, he gets the work done for his boss at any cost, right? It's a, it's beautiful mythology. But the problem is an organization is not a set of individuals. It's a set of interrelated pieces, right? So if our boss, instead of saying to me, Ed, here's your goals, and says to Jay, Jay, here are your goals, says, okay, Ed and Jay, you have your goals. We've figured out what those are. You know what they are. You're held accountable to them. Also, here are my goals. So you, you, you know, Ed, Jay, your couple peers, all of us on this team, we're on a team, and the team is, has a job, and the job is to reduce my set of goals. So Ed, Jay, other people, your goals are subordinate to my goals, meaning your job is to get my goals done. You all succeed when my goals are done. You all fail if they're not. So now all of a sudden, you know, when, when Jay and Ed bump into each other in the need for resources, instead of running to the boss and saying, hey, referee this fight for us, we're going to the boss and saying, hey, we've got a crossover here, we've got a conflict, here's what we recommend to keep your goals on track, will you approve this? So essentially we're looking up and we're helping her do her job instead of forcing her into this referee situation. Now, I've just described a very simple thing you can do as a manager, which is you say to your team, you each have your own goals, but here are my collective goals for our team, and you all are successful or not in my eyes based upon whether we meet my goals. It's a simple behavior. But until you say to your team also, hey, if you have direct reports who manage others, I expect you to give that same talk to your team. I want you to manage in the way I'm managing because it only works if we all manage in the same way. Until you do that, you're still in that North American model. You're still saying, everybody get your stuff done as you see fit, and I'll knit it together. And that is, it's just less efficient. It sounds better, it feels better in some ways, but it is measurably and knowably less efficient than having the things be coordinated because in real life, again, your organization is a set of coordinated pieces. It's not a set of individuals functioning autonomously, even though we'd like to believe it is. We're talking with N. Muzio, author of the book, Iterate, uh, run a fast, flexible, focused management team. And he's brought to you by Inline Business Brokers. Are you a business owner? Or do you, maybe you're looking to buy a business. Well, I'll tell you what, business bro inline business brokers and advisors have helped literally thousands of clients in the sale and purchase of businesses. So when it's time to sell your business, contact the professionals at inline business brokers and advisors. You can learn more by going to inline.com. That's www.enlign.com. Jeff Snell, owner, founder, COO of the company, was been on the show. Uh, has become he loved it so much he became a sponsor. I love that when that happens. Uh, when people love the show so much. And so uh, he's anywhere you're at, I don't care, in the United States, he can help you 
his, him and his team can help you buy or sell a business that you're looking for. So, Ed, one of the things that uh, seems to hinge on Iterate is something that it took me a while to wrap my mind around. So maybe you can help me simplify it. Is this VSO or verbalized summary output? And I, I, I found it a fascinating that really it's kind of a hinge pin for me. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I read it wrong. But it seemed to me that if I can successfully verbalize and summarize my objective and what I do, what I'm doing, what my goals are in under three minutes, right? If I can do that, I'm not only saving the company time, I am saving, I am, I've got this thing really written in stone in my brain of what it is that I'm trying to accomplish and what my behaviors are. Have I misread that in some way? No, I think you've got it. I mean, there's a reason it's first in the book. It's in the first chapter of the, of the key practices. And it's in some sense, one of the more intuitive pieces, I think, because it's sort of, if you don't have clear goals, how are you going to measure them? How are you going to manage them, et cetera? So I think that's pretty clear. What's unique, I think, and important about the, the VSO, the verbalized summary outputs, is it actually goes back to uh, social research and, and organizational research back in the 60s. You're a Skinner guy. You'll appreciate this. It goes back to when you know, researchers followed people around and wrote down what they did. Right. And the research was around highly effective management and researchers were literally following managers around and writing down what they were doing yep. on a minute to minute basis, you know, for 24 hour periods. Right. And one of the things they found was highly effective managers really kind of say the same thing over and over and over again. They keep articulating over and over again these short 90 second kind of infomercials, which is here's the output I'm tasking my resources, the people I'm responsible for people, you know, physical resources, budgets, here's the output I'm planning to deliver. There's a couple reasons for that that maybe aren't so obvious. The first one is that the more you teach everybody what you're doing, the more they leave you alone for things you're not doing. So it helps get the system smarter so that the work you need gets routed to you more naturally and the things that will distract you get routed away from you. The second reason that's probably even a little less obvious is trust between humans is built through making and meeting commitments. So after I say to you 10 times, because you're my peer in this fictitious organization, Jay, here's what I'm going to deliver over the next year, and then you see me deliver it, that builds trust much more effectively than if I had delivered it without telling you in advance. So it's almost like a cheat for trust, but it also gives you that visibility into what I'm trying to do so that, back to our other story, when you and I have a conflict over resources, I already understand what you're trying to do, you already understand what I'm trying to do, and so we can sit on the same side of the table and say, what are we going to recommend to our boss about this so we don't break anything too badly and still get her goals done as best we can, given this new information, this new thing we discovered that now we're conflicting over these resources. So there's a lot of good reasons to have that short infomercial about your output and to be as clear as you can with everybody around you about what you're trying to do. I, I, you know, I'm going to tell you that you know, one of the things that you talked about when it came to the VSO, the verbalized summary outputs, is that here they here uh, Alice, Cal, and Bob, I think it was, were in a meeting right. with Max. And so here they are, and they come into the meeting, and it's kind of like they have their dashboard, which is basically their chart of their VSO, right? Is, is that a safe way right. to put that? Right. And, and so... Here they ha and but they stay even in front of even in this meeting right which you don't really call a meeting I'm gonna have you I'm gonna have you talk about that in a second here and they all state what they're doing nobody's taking up too much time because what a waste I have been in these meetings even in 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 businesses I have consulted where I go to the owner you you've got to tell person B you, you've got to tell them to stop talking because they don't they're just rambling. You know, when you are with the VSO helps you be very clear on what it is you're going to do. I, we've all been in these meetings where somebody I feel like just wants to hear themselves talk, right? And so the meeting has no per the meeting all of a sudden loses its purpose. And then, you know, wait till I get to your mountain chart of you know, are you way in? You know, are you in? Are you out? Are you way out? <laughs> you know, or are you dominating? <laughs> so you know, I mean, so. I, I think it's brilliant that even even though the managers know what your VSO is, you're still going to restate it, or, or it's going to be in the dashboard. 
right? I, I just find it's that... there. It's always in front of everybody. That's right. It's always in front of everybody, and it's the basis for the conversation. And, and you said it exactly right, which is we, one of the things. You know, when I like you said, like oh my, my whole practice is in this book. When I'm observing meetings, I'm looking for how much narrative traffic there is. Right, airtime in a meeting is a scarce resource, and if it takes each person in the meeting, and it's five people in the meeting, and it takes each of us nine minutes to explain how things are going, we've spent the entire hour on what's already happened. And we're not being the feedback system. We're not looking forward and adjusting. We're just a bunch of people sitting around talking, right? So it is absolutely about reducing airtime spent on narrative updates and moving that airtime over to use it for forward-looking, proactive resource allocation problem solving. Which leads us to the meeting portion, right? Because you know what? Sometimes we meet to meet, right, with our managers. We just meet to meet because we feel like we got to meet. And, and, and it's not that meetings are bad in of themselves, but... Typically, meetings lose their objective, and then we walk away with what, right? Which is the, just the wrong thing, right? I mean, we should be walking away with something really clear and actionable at the end of a meeting, right? But we're generally... Certainly at the end of a management meeting or problem-solving meeting, we'd like to walk out with some resource allocation decisions, with a solution to a problem, with an approved recommendation. We'd like to go in knowing what we're planning to walk out with, and we'd like to walk out with it. And that requires, as you said, some focus on the objective of the meeting and also some some processes that keep us out of that sort of long-winded storytelling mode that, that he's all the time. <laughs> but you don't call the meetings. You call them you don't call the meeting a meeting. You call it something completely different. My work preview meeting, you mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so talk yeah, about, so, so talk so about the that. The work preview meeting is it, it's what I call the staff meeting. And again, I don't particularly care if other people don't want to use that term, but but it's right. the operational definition, which is a staff meeting is the manager and the team checking in on how things are going relative to what they're trying to get done. Now, this is where that forward-looking data that I mentioned comes in. So it comes in. So let's say that one of my objectives is to deliver some outputs. I could come in with a graph that shows all the outputs I delivered until today. That's pretty typical in the North American management model. And then our boss would say to me, Ed, what do you think is going to happen next? And then I would talk in the narrative for 9 to 12 minutes, right? right? What I need to do instead is come in with what I call two futures in my graph, which is, yeah, sure, here's what I did up until now. Now, here is the original future, which is what we thought the plan was last time we checked, beginning of the year, whatever. And then here is a second future, which is my most current forecast relative to what I think is really going to happen. And so that way, the whole focus is, are those two different? Which means, has my understanding of the future changed? If it hasn't, there's nothing to talk about. We keep going on whatever we're doing. We talk about something else. But if it has, if there's what I call variance between the old future and the new future, meaning I now expect something different to happen in the future than I, what I thought was going to happen before. That's the rich area for conversation because now I need to turn to you and say, hey, Jay, you're dependent on this output. It's going to be different than I thought. Do I need to do something different? Do you need to do something different? What do we do about that? And the work preview meeting is the regular meeting of a management team in pursuit of the head of the team's goals, the leader's goals, right. around checking what has changed in the future and our understanding of it and what, if anything, should we do differently. That's what a work preview meeting is, and it has to happen regularly because that's how the organization iterates, right? That's how we keep doing that right. check and adjust, check and adjust. Although we hate meetings, it has to happen in a meeting. That's the only way to do it. Right, and, and this probably the, it's, it's probably the reason why we don't like meetings is because quite often we're not really accomplishing anything. And, and what you're describing is that every meeting we're going to accomplish something. We're, 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 because things, things are not static, if, if, if we're being really honest with ourselves, business is fluid. I don't care what business you're in. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I, I could see that Josh Oliver is here and he's, you know, he manages a, a moving company. He's a, he's a lead manager for a moving company. And, and I'm, he's, he's on here. And I'm like going, well, Josh has to manage all sorts of people, right? And I know that they have meetings, but, you know, I'm sure there's a frustration that he has. You know, what did we accomplish here? And, I'm sure the people who are in those meetings go, what did we accomplish here? But your your preview meeting is so different because what we're saying here is we're fluid. So this is what I thought was going to happen. If if I show up to this meeting this week, the fact of the matter is based on what I'm seeing this week, this isn't going to happen the way I thought it was going to happen because that's business. That's just That's just how business is. So we've got a new plan. This is my new plan. This is how I see it going. Or this is how I see this moving, but it's true, right? Ed, that 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 could change. It could change from week to week because that's just the way, 
you know, or month to month, right? I mean, that could so it could be more than one futuristic plan because we may have to alter it based on whatever the market conditions are or whatever's happening, right? Am I, or did I make that up? No, that's right. I mean, so so let's say we have this meeting and, and we all decide that, you know, Ed's new forecast is the new expectation because we realize we can't hit the old one. Right. That probably is now the forecast. And, you know, another week or two or three or four, when I come in and say, let me tell you how my future looks, I'm probably comparing it to that one, not the original one from the beginning of the year, because once we all agree on the new plan, right. then you're going to mobilize your resources to that plan. My other peers are going to mobilize their resources. Right. So So it is about constantly changing the future expectation and then saying, has it changed again, right? And that's because, I mean, this is the key thing. All you can do as a manager, you can't change what's been done. Right. You, the only lever you have to pull is resource allocation. You can move people around, you can move money around, right. you can reassign equipment and resources. That's all you can do. And so the most intelligent use of that lever is to say, sitting here at this moment, understanding where we're trying to head and understanding if our, what's, what we're doing right now is going to get us there or not, do I need to make adjustments to resources today to get the future I'm going to get to look like the future I want to get? Right. That's management in a nutshell. And if you're not doing that as management with a capital mint, right. then you're not doing the job. And you can't do that without your peers. You can't do that all by yourself. And you can't do it unless you're looking forward and having good, useful meetings that all look forward together. Yeah. And, and, and you know, this is this is the thing that I find, I think, that might be frustrating for some people because we are so locked into this North American U.S. management system where, you know, we like, we all certainly like autonomy. Listen, I'd be the first one to admit, Ed, I sometimes do not play well with people in the sandbox, okay? I'm just going to be really honest with you. I just, I, I it's why I kind of have to do my own thing because every now and then, I just I, it's, I just want that independence. I'm I'm you know as much as I have been uh, I like to think of myself as a team player. There have been occasions in my work life where I quite frankly have not been a team player. I have been as selfish as they come, and I want you to leave me alone and let me to my own devices, right or wrong. And I'm I'm the first to admit that. And it's probably a result of this North American management style. That says, give me the autonomy to do what I want to do so I can do the job that I need to do. Your, what you're proposing in Iterate, by the way, the book is called Iterate, and run a fast, flexible, focused management team. It's by Ann Inc. out of New York City is the publisher. But what you're proposing here is that when your management team or your folks get together, this isn't about everybody necessarily agreeing. This isn't about you not doing your job it's about understanding how all of this that what you're doing as managers actually kind of link together and that you have to see because it's based on behavior not based on title how those behaviors coincide with that with each other for the bigger picture is that is that well pretty good that's right and and i mean actually there's a couple things to say about that one of them is you actually don't lose autonomy in the way that it sounds like. And here's why. Remember, you know, here's Jay and here's Ed working for the boss. We each still have our own goals. We each still have control of our own resources in our own world to achieve those goals. As long as I can make adjustments and modifications inside my world to stay to the plan that I've agreed to with my peers and my manager, then actually we don't want that in the work preview meeting with our manager and our peers because that's noise, right? It is up to me to run my world as best I can until something happens that puts me out of that, meaning I can't accomplish it alone anymore. I need to either borrow resources from Jay or adjust my forecast. So I'm already not autonomous. And that's, that I think is the, where we're trying to just be realistic and say, sometimes you are autonomous, sometimes you're not. When you're not, you have to own up to it and you have to come into the meeting and, and then you have to do exactly what you said, which is have the conversation, right? Bring it up. Right deal with it. You mentioned the hill of influence, the little hill about, you know, interactive levels. Right. We want everybody, that's a model that shows how interactive people are in the meeting, how engaged they are. Right. We need everyone engaged, right? If I'm talking about a plan that I have to deliver some output and it's going to change and it affects your work and people in your organization, but you, Jay, are asleep that day and don't listen to it, <laughs> you've just decoupled your whole part of the organization from the work, right? So right. we need you engaged. We need me engaged. We need our boss engaged to give us feedback on what's more important. And we need to decide what do we do about Ed's variance? 
and do we do anything about it? Do we not do anything about it? Do we move more resources? Is it a help Ed fix it situation? Right. Is it a get used to it situation, which is right. his new forecast is the new forecast, adjust yourselves accordingly. You can do whatever you want right. as long as you are participating together to make the collective best decision. So, yeah, the North American management model would say, you know, if you're Jay, that's right. Ed and that's Ed's problem, not mine. Right. But the problem with that is it's still the organization's problem, and maybe it would be better if – some resources got moved to me because that serves the higher level goal better. Right. We'll never know that if we take the approach of saying, you know, your problems aren't my problems. Right. I, I get it. And, and so let's talk about the antithesis of that, though. And because I think there's a little bit of an antithesis, and that is the common strategy is if I'm a manager, I go to the CEO or the person above me and I have a private meeting rather than having this meeting all on the same level. Right. We do these private meetings. Right. Because I'm like going. Hey, Ed, Ed, if Ed, you're the you're you're my CEO and I'm your your next level manager. Hey, Ed, listen, I want to talk to you about Josh because, you know, look, I I know he's got a new plan, but you're about to reallocate sources from me, and I'm just telling you, Ed, Ed, we we I can't we can't do that. That that's just wrong because it's going to make me look bad. If you start taking my resources and handing them over to Josh, now this is being done in a private meeting. This is a, this right. is typically you and I both know this is typically what happens is there's these private closed door management to CEO meetings. You're saying stop that stuff right now. Well, honestly, I mean whether you're the CEO or a mid-level manager, if if you have direct reports either on your team or ones that are layers down from you and they're bringing you issues to referee individually that should be solved by the groups, it, as soon as you do anything other than refer them back to the group, you have taken on the role of essentially a parent in a dysfunctional household, right? <laughs> so everyone is going to run to you from then on with everything they want. So, you know, what we try and do instead is say, look, you know, whether you're the CEO, whether you're a middle manager, we're going to get real clear about what kinds of issues get decided by groups. If it's an issue that affects Ed's work and Jay's work in support of Ed and Jay's boss and those goals, then those issues have to get sorted out in that group. Now, it doesn't mean we can't have, you know, open door policy or closed door meetings where, you know, I go up above my manager's head and say, I think there's something unethical happening, or I think that, you know, there's, there's a problem in the compensation or something, something that needs to be brought up in a one-on-one issue. Certainly managers and employees still have one-on-ones about their vacation time and their coverage. And if they need help on a certain issue or whatever, that's all fine. But as soon as one of those group resource allocation meetings gets brought into those one-on-ones, the, the savvy manager will say, oh, sorry, we can't do this here. We can't talk about something that affects Jay's output with just you and me, Ed, because Jay's not here. So let's put that on the meeting agenda for the next meeting, and if it's important enough, we'll spend some time dealing with that variance and what it's going to be. And so it's not particularly difficult to delineate between those issues once you know what you're looking for, but if you're not carrying the definition around in your head, then as a manager, it's too easy to jump into problem solving on one of those things one-on-one. And once you do, you've opened the door for that from then on, and you've wiped out the effectiveness of those group meetings. Mm. See, I, I love that. See, I love that because I think it's so easy for the manager or the CEO to all of a sudden be the referee. And I think there's kind of this expectation of, you know, you're supposed to handle it. But the truth of the matter is, man, if we could solve our problems as a group, as a CEO, you can, you can do what you need to do to make it rain. Because the group is solving the problem. You're not having to solve every, you know, every little, you know, complaint. Because that's what, you know, it's, you know how the avalanche starts, right? It starts with something major, and then all of a sudden it just turns into you're the complaint department as a manager or the CEO. There are a lot of managers functioning as a complaint department. Their job satisfaction is low. Their stress levels are very high. They're suffering in their work. They're probably losing years off their life. And also they're not serving the organizations well. It's really, really unfortunate. And, and the way out is, is exactly that. It's to start to be clear about what we do in groups, what we do individually, and, and to not allow those lines to get fuzzy. Because if you, if you become the complaint department, you also aren't good at it because you're making that decision. You know, Ed and the CEO are making the decision without Jay in the room. And the impact to Jay is important to understand for the good of the organization. Uh, and so instead, we don't do that. We say, Ed, Jay, manager, get together, sort it out as a group. And, and remember, Ed, Jay, Neither of you is successful if your goals are met, but the other person's aren't, right? So all of a sudden, Ed and Jay are looking up at the boss. And all of a sudden, that boss, who's managed the same way at the next level, is looking up at her boss. 
And so, as you just said, with everyone looking up, the CEO and the senior executives can look out and forward, right? right? If everyone's looking down, if I'm looking down at my goals and you're looking down at your goals and our boss is looking down at both of us and checking how we're doing against our goals and refereeing our fights, that means that her boss is looking down at her and her goals and refereeing her fights with her peers. Now the CEO is stuck looking down at the top level saying, are you getting your piece done? Are you getting your piece done? Right. That's the antithesis. That's the North American management model. Bring me your piece and I'll put it together. That's the guy on the horse. It doesn't work. It doesn't Don't bring work. me your piece and I'll put it together. Here's what we're doing as a team. You all need to help me figure this out. Right. That's, that's everyone looks up and the executives look forward. That's how we carry the company forward. Yeah, and, and that's beautiful because it, it, it's certainly, it, it's just a far more efficient process. When, you know, going on, and by the way, we're talking to Ed Musio. He's author of this amazing book called Iterate, uh, Run a Fast, Flexible, Focused Management Team. Let me tell you about this book. This book, by the way, is not just a book to read. He has got activities in this book. These are practical, useful activities that you can do with your team, with your management team. Folks, If I don't care what level you are in your business. You need to be running through these in your head. You need to be writing out. You need to know what your BSO is. I'm not even going to tell you what BSO is. Maybe Ed will, but I'm not going to tell you what a BSO is because you should buy the book and find out what a BSO is. All right? That's what you should do. Now that's not nice, Jay. I think you should tell them what the VSO is. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a verbal summarize, verbalized summary output. Okay? That's what a VSO is. All right? But it's in this book, and you need to know really what the definition of the verbalized summary output or the VSO is because it really is a hinge pin for a lot in this book. Let me tell you something else. That if you buy the book, whether it's the ebook or this hardcover book that I'm holding in my hand, this blue-covered, beautiful book, it comes with a code that you can go to the website, which is called Iterate Now. I-T-E-R-A-T-E now.com and you can go to Iterate Now and you can watch Ed's videos. There's all sorts of resources available and by the way, they're so practical and we're going to get into one of them here real quick but you know what? i got to do a, you know, a public service message and that is are you a business owner? Right? Maybe you are because that's what we're talking about business owners and managers. At some point, you're going to need the services of an experienced business broker to sell your business. And you know what? Selling your business is a huge decision. So make sure you build your ideal team, starting with the experts at inline business brokers and advisors. They, I'm telling you, they're outstanding. They do business valuations more. They, they, will, I, they will just get you what you need. I promise you, they are amazing. You can learn more of them online. It's inline.com. It's www.enlign. Dot com. All right, so Ed, one of the I want to I want to, uh, and we're certainly so thankful for Jeff Snell, and who's the owner of Inline, for sponsoring the show and Ed today. And iterate the book, by the way, there it is again. All right, so let's do a little practical fun here, okay? Because I thought you did something in one of the videos that would, and it's actually in the book too. But I thought, oh man, this is going to be so fun to do with a team after a team meeting. So one of the things that we briefly talked about is that when we're in a team meeting, we kind of want to make sure everybody's engaged, okay? So everybody, you drew these circles. You had a circle in the middle, the small circle, and it said dominate, and then you had a circle outside of that that said weigh in, then you had a circle outside of that that said in, and then you had a circle outside of that that said, was it out? Uh Right, out. It's, it's way in, in, out, and way out. And way and out. the middle right. is dominate. That's right. right, way out, right. And what it, right, and so this is, after the meeting's over, how did, where do you think everybody was at? And I thought, well, God, this would be a fun game because you as the manager could say, well, I saw Ed as kind of way in, and I saw Josh as out, and I saw Jordan, a uh, good fellow, I saw him as way out, right? He wasn't really paying attention. So to describe this game, but there's a there, there, you had a fun little twist to it that I thought was kind of neat, and I think you know where I'm going, right? With this, the the little twist. I think so. You're talking about the with the sticky notes and then moving yeah, yeah, them around yeah, for each other. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, this is fun. I love this. Go ahead. Do it. Do it, Ed. I just, just. Yeah. So so you you get your flip chart. You draw your circles and you label. So so what's important to note here, first of all, is inside, which is dominate, is bad, right? Obviously, dominating can happen through either too much talking, which is the obvious one or through asking too many questions, right? I can dominate a meeting by talking very little if I just keep asking questions because I'm forcing the topic, right? So don't want dominating. We want tuned way in, which is talking appropriately, and or tuned in, which is listening appropriately. We don't want tuned out or tuned way out, which is you know re reading your phone and not paying attention, right? So you, you get done with the meeting, you put your name on a little sticky note, and you stick it up there where you think you are, and then everybody goes up and has a chance to negotiate people. 
so I can go, well, Jay, I see that you've put yourself here and dominate, but I actually think, I don't think you were dominating. I think you were appropriately engaged in that part of the discussion. Or alternatively, I can say, Jay, I see you have your tuned way in, but I want to tell you I couldn't get a word in edgewise for no less than nine minutes. Um, I think you're a little bit more toward dominating here, at least in, in this part of the conversation. And so what you're really doing, you know, it doesn't actually matter that much if everyone's post-it notice in exactly the right place, but you're fostering a dialogue about what does it look like to be tuned way in versus dominating? What does it look like to be listening appropriately versus tuned out? We know that the actual fact of being tuned in or tuned out matters to the group output. We also know from research that if you're in a meeting and you appear to be tuned out, that appearance will actually reduce the effectiveness of the other people in the meeting. So even if you are tuned in, learning how to look like you are is important. And, and so this is a tool that, that drives the conversation in that direction because what we really want is what's called an equitable norm state, which is, again, everybody's either talking appropriately or listening appropriately, and nobody is overly dominating the airtime of the conversation, and nobody is essentially dragging the team down by sitting there looking like they don't care. That's what we're after. And that, that tool, it's called the Hill of Influence. You can actually, I think, Google the Hill of Influence, and you'll find the video on YouTube is, is very helpful in that regard. Yeah, it's the Hill of Influence, and you can't find it on a YouTube. I really highly suggest that you go, managers, CEOs, do, do it. As a matter of fact, my wife, uh, is the lovely, talented Linda Craft, www.lindacraft.com. Yes, that's a cheap plug, but what the heck. Uh, anyway, so uh, I told her, I said, you got to do this with your folks. Like, even when you're doing the phone calls, is when the phone calls are over because, you know, she does the Zoom or whatever it is, the, the thing I said, you need to have them at the end. Find out who, you know, what did they think? You know, was this person dominant? Were they in? Were they out? And everything. Because I said there was a lot of silence on the phone because I was listening to the conversation. And she said, yeah, I, said, I think we need, you know, you, you know, she was like, hmm, you know, this might be good to get more people engaged. And I think that's what that's what's important is because I think what happens is we'll, we'll excuse behavior. Like we'll excuse, well, they're introverted, right? So we'll just let them go. But that's not really... Yeah, I, I, that, that becomes a little dangerous. You have to recognize and appreciate people are different and that you know being tuned in looks different for some than others. That's all fair. But if you have somebody who's legitimately tuned out, that's, that's problematic. And in a phone situation, you have the silence, which is awkward. In a live situation, you have the visual appearance of being tuned out. That's even more awkward. It's problematic. You're not going to get good group results if you don't have the right people around the table. And you're not going to get good group results if those right people aren't engaged in the thing you're trying to work on. Did, did you hear Ed correct me on, yeah, he's not ready to go there with introverts, right? But, but here's, here's, what, here's what I want to say from a psychological standpoint. Introverts, you have a lot to contribute. And while you may be somewhat shy and you may not, sometimes the introversion can come in a lot of different forms in that you may feel that you're shy or maybe you feel that what you have to say is, is not important. The truth of the matter is what I know about most introverts is that you're incredibly deep observers and you actually have some very powerful things to say. And I'm not asking you to say a bunch of things, but please, because I know that your mind is working over time and that you're generally great and that analysts of things, your input is so valuable. So uh, please contribute, even if it's only once. You could still be way in and only have one contribution, but that could be the most contrib largest contribution to the conversation. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, in or out is not a measure of how many times you spoke. It's a measure of the engagement you displayed by speaking. And absolutely, yeah, it's not, it's not that you only win by being an extrovert. Right. Uh, by the way, another good reason to do that activity a few times is once people get in the habit of paying attention to this, you start to see the team kind of self-facilitate a little, which is mm -hmm. someone who's more extroverted might turn to someone who's more introverted and say, you know, Jay, I haven't heard from you in a little while. What are you thinking? I see you look concerned or, you know, do you have something to say? And, and start to draw each other out. You can have someone play the facilitator role. That's not a bad thing. But once you start to have this common language and common attention around levels of contribution, then you get everybody playing the facilitator role, and that's way more powerful. I, it, it, it is. Okay, so I know we're running. We're getting low on time here. I'm down to my last five minutes. I can't even believe it. It just goes so fast when I'm with people. It went fast. It, it, when I'm with people that I just – enjoy and I, I literally we could be sitting at the table for hours and just I just want to talk to you about this because there's so many things that I want to talk to you about iterate and and because I just I just loved the book and by the way folks in the back of this book iterate I just want to let you know there's this appendix and it's a very significantly large appendix in the back and I'm not talking about the thing that's in your stomach I'm talking about the appendix in the back of the book anyway there's this thing in the 
there's he has an appendix in the back of the book. It's very significant, and it's got tools. He's got uh, troubleshooting places. He's got summaries of the book and everything. I did not I did not read the summaries of the book. I actually read the entire book cover to cover. I am telling you, the appendix is really, really powerful. Really, really powerful. Uh, whether you're a manager, a CEO, consultant, coach, whatever, really, really, really powerful in terms of running your business and running your company appropriately. It's going to be really, there's helpful tools in there as well. All right, there's one little piece I want to cover because I thought it was so fantastic. There's a lot of fantastic, but there's one little thing. I love the OSIR chart. I loved it. The objective status issue recommendation. I loved that. Let's let's talk about that. I, I know we don't have enough time to talk about it fully, but let's talk about why that's so important. Well, maybe it's appropriate that we do it fast because it's designed to make things happen fast. And that is, you know, in that work preview meeting, in that forward-looking meeting, when I want to come in and say, hey, I've got a problem and I can't solve it without Jay's resources, the OSIR is how I do that. I say my objective, as you remember, is to deliver these kind of outputs in the schedule. My status, as you can see on my chart, which you already know how to read, is that my two futures have a variance between them. That's the S. My issue, the I, is my resources are different than I thought or I couldn't get what I needed or something didn't happen or something did happen, whatever. Here's the root cause of why my two futures are different. That's the cause of the variance. And my recommendation is I think we should reassign some dollars out of Jay's budget to my budget so I can fix it. Right. It takes me about that long. What was that? 30 seconds. Yeah, I think and, and now I've, I've set the table. I've put the problem on the table. I've contextualized it for you. And I've made a specific straw man proposal. And now I've opened up the airtime in the team to talk about it. So Jay can say, hey, if I do that, this is what breaks for me. Somebody else can say, you know, here's an idea. I could help you with this. Right. And we're opening up the airtime to the problem solving part of the conversation because the OSIR allows the setup to be efficient and effective, but also quick. See I, see, I really, really, really love that because first of all, it's a, it's really short. But you've 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 clearly planned. You clearly know, it's it's basically an elevator pitch of where you're at and where you're going and what your problems are and what you need, what you think a solution is. But here's the other piece. The other piece that I love is it goes back to the management, Mint Capital M E N T. They're not. They all of a sudden stop being managers, and you become a team of management that is helping to determine if the proposed solution is the best solution, and they're going to work together to find the best solution. But it opens the door to that creative process. That's right. The R is a recommendation. It doesn't mean that's how I think it's going to go, but it's my best recommendation. Now let's talk about that and find a way home and find an answer. As best we can. Yeah, I, I just I I love that, and I I God, there's so much I want to talk to you about, Ed, because I loved, you know what I really loved is at the end of every meeting, I, there was one little thing that you did was you said, I want you to silently write down what what we are to do and what is the rationale for why I did it, right? So that everybody was on the exact same page at the end of the meeting. Oh, that that's the back end of decision making. That's right. After the decision is made, if we don't all understand what the decision was and why it was made there's a pretty good chance we're not going to implement it correctly. And that is as bad as not deciding because it gets the organization out of sync, right? My resources are different than your resources. Right. If we don't spend the time on that, that that's, it's not sufficient. It, it doesn't matter. And the, it, right. Right. Because it doesn't matter. No matter how great a solution is, we're not going to implement it at 100%. And 100% implementation is you know, mission critical. So we've got to know this is what we're going to do. This is why we're doing it. Everybody knows that so that it can be implemented at 100%. It's just it's a great book. All right, listen. We're right, because the implementation is the next step across the parking lot. If you don't take the step, you don't learn anything new. You have to you have to actually take the step. Yeah, I love that. Okay, Ed, I ask this of every one of my guests that come on A New Direction. If you were going to leave us with, with my folks who are watching, listening, wherever they're at right now, with A New Direction when it comes to uh, connecting themselves and management and their business, give us what Ed would do as a summary of A New Direction for these folks out there. You know, I think that the idea I would leave you with is agility trumps planning. Agility beats planning every time. Now, I'm not saying planning is bad. I'm not saying you should start off your year and not have a plan. But I'm saying things change so fast that I think we all know that the plan you make in January isn't so good anymore by June. And so if you give me a choice between a company that made a sketchy plan to a clear goal 
but it's very agile and adapting, and a company that made a very complete, very robust plan to a clear goal but has trouble deviating from it, I'm going to bet all my money on the agile group every time, and they're going to win almost every time because if the plan's good, they'll follow it. If the plan's bad, they'll fix it, and, and their odds just are that much higher. So if you're, if you're looking to do something on a team, whether it's a whole organization, whether it's a small company you run, whether you're a manager at a lower level, think in terms of is my team – Agile. Can we adjust? Can we change course when we need to? Are we constantly learning and then using that knowledge to adjust our course? Because if we're not, you can't fix that with planning. You can't fix that with compensation. You can't fix that with motivation. All of those things actually start to have trouble when you're not succeeding. And you can't succeed unless you're agile, unless you can adjust, because everything's just changing too fast. Mm. Folks, it's Ed Musio. He wrote this book. It's called Iterate. Run a fast, flexible, focused management team. It's, I'm telling you, this book is practical. It is useful. Throughout this entire book, it is a practical, useful guide for you to help manage your people. And you know what's going to, not manage your people, but to bring your people together to become a team that becomes a thermostat for you to determine how to be more flexible and agile in your business so that what happens is that you've created a team atmosphere that's going to help your business become far more successful and efficient. It is absolutely a terrific book. It's got everything that you want, and it's going to. And by the way, if you buy the book or the ebook, it comes with videos and resources that you can go to iterate now, i t e r a t e now dot com, and you can find out more information. His name is Ed Musio. Buy this book, folks. You know what I tell you every time. I'm telling you, it's the people on the show that I get to interview that inspire us the most, and Ed Musio did that today. He inspired us. Right, he gave us something that he was is passionate about, and then what he did is he wrote it in a book, and then he was able to share it with us here on a new direction. And that inspiration should be a little bit of motivation for us to make a change, right? Because none of the, none of this happens if we don't change something. And as change is difficult and scary, but inspiration is a way that we can get past all that. So, folks, as you're going about your day, I want you to think about how you can iterate. I want you to think about how you can inspire someone else. To motivate them because when we inspire others they inspire others in turn and that's what this is about and it will help you find a direction I appreciate you all for watching and listening I can't wait to see you we're gonna be we're gonna have another great guest next week it's gonna be a lot of fun and I will talk to you soon ciao everybody